If you can introduce, in the first term of a Labor government, a legislative agenda which will lead inexorably towards this setting up of an Australian head of state, can you give the party members here gathered and in front of these TV lights a commitment that over the next several years of in opposition, you will tell the Australian public that if you get into government in terms of reform and change, that you will set that legislative agenda in place. I am a Republican. I, for the life of me, have not found an argument which says why we shouldn't have an Australian head of state. So uh, that is my view. In order of how we achieve that though, it's going to be up to the people who believe in an Australian head of state convincing Australians of that. Um, we've got the lovely visit uh, currently by the Young Royals. You know, they're winning hearts and minds, that's great. The point about it is if we want to explain to Australians why an Australian head of state is important, we can't just simply sit in a castle, not that we would because we're Republicans, <laughs> sit in a palace, and just... And just be a set of the foreign power to hunt you people down. No, I think the we're also... So my point is, if you want the change in Australian society that we think it should go to, it's up to us to convince not the Abbott Liberals about it, we won't get them, we have to convince the Australian people. What I'm proposing here is a vehicle, a mass membership, a membership Labor Party, 100,000 members is not actually a mass membership, certainly a lot bigger than what we got. The Labor Party needs to become a campaigning movement again. We can't just answer questions in sound bites. People have got to think that we're fired up about stuff, we're passionate, we mean what we say. It's we can all remember. Well, you and, I, you and I are on the same bandwagon. The problem is that we need to convince a lot of other Australians. That's why one thing I'd like to see come out of today's session is can all of you here, it's great you're here. Can't you go and ask another dozen friends in the next month to join the Labor Party? Because when we become big and active and, and a movement again. Give them a reason, Comrade. Well, an Australian head of state's one reason, and you'll get a say in your free selections is another reason. Next question. Good process. Why not always guarantee you the best candidates, but it eliminates some of the uh, poorer candidates that emerge? I'm not particularly talking about the last Western Australian process there. What I am saying unequivocally is good process in involving locals, having a local component in our Senate pre selection, will take away picking senators from a couple of people and providing a lot more honesty and checks and balances. That's why I think what I'm proposing makes sense. That's why people should get on board with it, because everyone knows that the result from Western Australia is unacceptable. But I concur with your uh, unhappiness about the individual comments. They were, uh, they were very negative and hurtful. And generally, when it comes to party unity, there has been a culture in the party, and it wasn't just in the last four or five years, a sense that you can get ahead by backgrounding against your colleagues in the media. Mm. We in the Labor Party mm. need to indicate if you disagree with someone, have the debate. Ideally, don't have the debate on the front pages of a newspaper in the first instance. Have it to someone's face and talk about it within the party. But for all those who think it's clever politics to advance your own case by leaking, by uh, backgrounding, you know, call it naive, dysfunction will, will, will condemn us to perpetual opposition. We cannot afford to be divided. People who vote for us expect better from us, and we as the party need to stamp that culture of disloyalty out. The question is along these lines. We have seen the plenary powers misused as recently as the affirmative action decisions where the National Executive overrode the National Disputes Tribunal and the National Returning Officer to rubber stamp a deal. My question is. What will be done to limit the plenary powers so that they are in fact used for the good of the party and not simply as a tool by people within the party? Garth, um, you make a pretty solid point there. Uh, what I'm saying is that for Labor to be a strong party and strong on the issues like jobs or healthcare or schools or disability insurance, we need to demonstrate to Australians that we've changed. The way which we demonstrate we've changed, in part, is rebuilding. We rebuild by involving our members. I agree that increasingly the plenary power has been seen as a very convenient tool to use and as a substitute for going out and convincing members to support you. 
So I understand that. Uh, I'm not going to second guess every previous dispute. Uh, these matters are where they are. And I do want State Labor led by Daniel Andrews who's done a great job to be in the best possible position to help uh, contest the next state election. But the longer I go in the leadership, Garth, I say to you that I believe that it is uh, ultimately in the long term lazy, short term, and ultimately uh, counterproductive to rely on this plenary power. For the people who don't follow it, it's basically you go to the National Executive to get a pre selection outcome that you feel you can't get any other forum. It should be there as a power, but it should be the exception, not the rule. And the longer I go as leader, I believe we will create a situation where there is greater respect for the views of members balanced against what are perceived to be other interests. I hope that gives you some comfort for the future. It's not a retrospective ruling, I'm afraid. To increase our membership while we're in opposition, you need to do something. And uh, the policies that are speculative at the moment uh, from the uh, Abbott government about uh, reforming um, <coughs> making housing, for example, an asset for pensioners and so thereby um, making them feel that they have probably have to sell their house in some cases to be able to live. Um, it's, it creates problems that are very serious and need uh, a lot of research and I think that the Labor Party needs a research section working all the time in opposition to deflate and point out to the public uh, the, the very serious um, problems with such a possible um, uh, policy. Uh, I haven't seen hardly any discussion at all, and it is a leak and it is speculative, the fact that I'm even speaking about it. Um, but all I uh, am old, as you can see, and I speak to a Oh, I'm very old. I was speaking to a lot of older people. Um, and so I know that this, just even the mention of it in the uh, press, has uh, made them very worried. Now, I think that uh, the Labour Party could really make something out of this worry, if you like, and uh, every uh, uh, policy that they put up that you can seriously um, break down uh, needs research and be voluntary or we might have to pay for it, but I think we need a group uh, working on that, not just saying that when we're getting power we're going to do this, that and the other thing. That's maybe a long way off. We're going to work for it. And working for it is pulling, uh, it is uh, not pulling them down, but making sure that we don't get tied <coughs> down to some, some terrible uh, things. Also, a uh, question of this, the 70 uh, pension uh, page. When I know so many I'll just catch off with the, the question more about research uh, yeah, function well, for the It's party. the same thing, yes, that should be it. Because there's so many people in their 50s who uh, can't get jobs. And uh, unfortunately, in government, and I was a government school teacher. I'll I'm, just catch off there. Why do you keep going with the question? The question about research function for yes, the opposition. Yes, okay. yes. Well, I, I heard, I heard, thank you very much for your observation. I heard two points here. One is, the research function. Uh, I guess this is a good ad for per capita. The more that we can uh, utilise per capita and support them, they provide ideas for progressive politics. So there's think tanks. There are uh, two or there's three at least I can think of out there, including Chifley Research Centre, which is supported by the Federal Labor Party in part. So there are some think tanks. We have some resources in the opposition, but of course we don't have anything like the weight of government. So we are working on policies. I would also just make this point, though, you've touched upon the, the, the current issue to do with pensions. Our spokesperson, Jenny Macklin, is working hard with a round table of experts to work out what is Labor's future approach on welfare policy and pensions policy. But there's no doubt that uh, the Abbott government's been relying in its first number of months on simply saying they're not Labor. The point of today's speech is to say to not only members of the party, but to Australians who are interested in politics, People are on notice the Labor Party will rebuild. We will get our processes right. We will become a more dynamic uh, movement in Australian politics. But the other point is that at the budget, the last opportunity for the Abbott Liberal government to simply just blame Labor starts to evaporate if it ever was. 
They're now in charge. Before the election, on no less than nine occasions, Tony Abbott said, wouldn't touch pensions. We well, would have to think that what happens before the election is not what they're thinking now, and they've broken their promises. Because what they're doing now is sending up lots of balloons, lots of kites, lots of thought bubbles. And I believe that this proposition around raising the retirement age to 70 is just such an issue. You can't begin to talk about lifting the pension age until you start talking about the discrimination which older Australians face in the labour market, to the difficulties in older Australians to find work, to recognising that many older Australians can't keep doing the same physically demanding work that they've been doing for the last 30 years. So the idea that you would simply raise the pension age, punish older Australians without a well, without even beginning to address all the inequities and unfairnesses of the labour market and discrimination shows you that this is a government with twisted priorities. So I believe that both on the substantial issue that you raise and the issue of research, we're doing work, but we need more members. If we have more members, we have more power, we have more chance to organise, and we can reflect the concerns of people. We need more members, and today I've put forward to you a value proposition why you should join the Labor Party. Because you can get a say in who your candidates are, because you can have a say in the ideas, and because the Labor Party is rebuilding to be a stronger party so that when it comes to speaking to the lives that Australians are living, we're the party for all Australians, not just vested interests. We will make a more gratuitous point for Cabinet. We currently have a research team on longevity. Ida Bart tries to launch that. We're an independent think tank, but we contribute to the universe of progressive ideas for the long-term benefit of Australia. The next launch, the next piece to be launched in that, is on the financial adequacy for retirement. I point you to Emily Mullane, who's in the audience, who's done a fantastic job. She's the research leader for our longevity project. So there, in a person, you have um, the ideas being funneled to her, and fantastic work on that specific issue as an example of the need for ideas uh, for a progressive Australia. We need much more support behind that. I acknowledge the Vincent Fairfax Foundation, for instance, for supporting that work. But by going, we need a lot more. So thank you for your question. More questions, please. Um, in the uh, suit coat with a white cuff on the right down here. Uh, thank you. Next to the one. Um, thank you. Uh, Bill, uh, uh, congratulations on what we've brought forward. I think it's uh, really, uh, really important. Um, I did want to get some clarification on two points, if, if that's possible. One was that uh, I think it's great that people will be able to join online. It's a, it's a terrific idea. I just want to clarify that those people will have full voting rights um, alongside of other members, including being able to stand for uh, conference delegates and uh, vote for conference delegates as well as their local members, that they won't be a kind of second class uh, membership as is the case at the moment with central members. And secondly, I, I would ask you that whether, I mean, joining online is a good thing, but there are many people uh, who are of non-English speaking background or elderly people who would find that process quite difficult. And we ought to have some other way as well. People should, for instance, be able to walk into uh, the ALP head office and join. They should be able to walk in probably to their local member's office and, uh, and ask to join the Labor Party. Uh, so I think there should be some other mechanisms for that as well. And then on the union side, uh, I think uh, what you're proposing is good, but I do think there is a, a need for unions to look at their own democratic processes, including how they select their own conference delegates internal. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think the unions are ready for change um, with some uh, leadership at that level in order that they can also come forward and say, look, we're democratic, we don't just speak. It's not just the union secretary that decides who all the conference delegates are going to be in, in, uh, uh, in the state conference. So I'd, I'd be interested in both <coughs> of those matters. Um, thanks very much, Dad. On the second issue first, I think unions are well advised to explain and involve their members if they choose to affiliate to the Labor Party. I think the proposition that you involve your membership uh, and you encourage your members directly to get involved, uh, to understand the processes and to have a say, is the way to go. Uh, it was certainly what I was keen to encourage in my time when I was a union rep. I think that the more that you encourage your members to be involved and to have a say and to be directly engaged, 
the stronger it builds the relationship, not the weaker. In terms of uh, joining, uh, Victoria, what I've discovered in the last few months is that every state and territory does it differently. It's one of the gifts of federation. Um, that we have national rules, but uh, every state implements them in various, in various ways. I believe in terms, the reason why I've spoken about using the internet to join is I think it is ridiculous, the current process is now how many to join the Labor Party. I think it is ridiculous that we had such long eligibility for people who have been able to participate in the recent internal elections in Victoria. I think it's really, people could join online before the federal election and vote for the leadership. They had to be a member of the Victorian branch for almost two years in order to vote for state conference delegate. Don't get me wrong, state conference delegate is important. But you know, we give them a chance to have a say in the leadership, we just don't trust them to pick their local delegates. So I think that um, we just need to loosen up. We had rules which were designed to prevent uh, small groups taking over the Labor Party. Our challenge now is that apathy is taking over the Labor Party. It is not that we've got too many people trying to take us over, it's that we're being hollowed out and not enough people are involved. Now of course there's many notable exceptions to that. But we should be a bigger party. Some people have laughed at me and said, oh, 100,000 members, you're kidding. What worries me wasn't that the number was too high. What worries me is that number's too low. I worry that we're not ambitious enough uh, to encourage people in. If we, think the late, if we think that Australian politics is sufficiently important to take up our time, then why on earth don't we have the conviction to encourage our friends and people we work with and our neighbours and the people in our clubs? So that's why I think online is important because I want to make it easier to join. You're quite right though. Not everyone is in the, uh, has access to the internet. So I agree generally the principle is, you know, decrease the paperwork, make it easier to join. That should be the general principle. <coughs> in terms of voting, well I think each state branch is going to have to work through how they give people voting rights. But what I believe, and what I'll be speaking in favour of the Victorian branch, is giving people voting rights. My view is, if we want to ask you to participate, we, we, we don't need to worry about the year and two year long sort of integrity checks. <coughs> uh, we just need to get, encourage people to uh, the ideological tests of whether or not someone's fair income. We don't ask people to recite the platform off by heart. We ask them are they willing to fill in enough forms and deal with enough branch officials such that they will never give up even if the paper won't be So I'm, we should be a bit of a whole party and we shouldn't let the practicality stop us getting to where we go. We just make a decision that we want to be a big party, then that's it. But I can't do that, nor can you individually. But as a group and across the nation, we make a decision that the Labor Party is ambitious. We're ambitious for this country, we're ambitious for our own party. We should be ambitious for our party because we're ambitious for this nation. <laughs> from your review, but also from the questions today, what barriers very broadly do you see to party reform, and particularly in a state and a, in a federated model? Well, I would take the view, and I'll, I'd argue for the view, that if we're asking people to join a party, it's interwoven with their desire to join on whether they can vote or not. Um, to get 100,000 people, why would you join up unless you, in a very short time, had the capacity to select a local candidate or to be involved in a a policy determination matter or to select someone for national conference. So I would argue strongly that we should get rid of the two year rule or the one year rule and say a matter of months. You can actually vote for the pre selected candidate you think is going to serve you well because you've got to have a motivating factor for people to join. Now, the reason is why do people want to join the Labour Party? You, know, you go to a film society, you want to see a film. You go to the Labour Party, you join the Labour Party because you want to do things and change things and get involved and have a say. And if you're saying for a couple of years you can't have a say, it doesn't make any sense at all. So I'd encourage every state official, no Carol's here, to push strongly to get rid of this stupid two-year rule and give people a say almost for me. There's been a lot of talk about members and numbers. Um, if you have compassion for people, then it's a different occurring for them. And I'm just asking, what is your understanding of compassion? Like how far and wide does that go? And what does, does it embrace asylum seekers and refugees? I understand compassion very clearly. 
it's when I saw the reports of this lady in sunshine who got killed by her uh, ex-partner on the steps of the court. I understand compassion is where we have a system where uh, people are greeted with racism when they come to this country. I understand that it is not a crime to want to come to Australia. I understand that compassion is making sure that kids get to finish school regardless of uh, the postcode they live in or the work with their parents. I get compassion is making sure that when your elderly parent may have an early onset disease, that you're not left stranded trying to work everything out by Google or doing 16 different interviews in terms of aged care facilities to make sure they get treated with some love and decency. In terms of our policies on uh, refugees, on asylum seekers, on boat arrivals, we're fortunate we've got Richard Miles here too who's working on our policies. But I also understand that compassion is not simply just saying that the people smugglers can't be stopped and therefore there's nothing we should do about it. I do agree, and Richard has been uh, patient and articulate today on what we saw reports in the age about uh, some of the goings on at Manus Island and Richard's pushing hard as his federal labour for a, for a transparent inquiry of what on earth has happened there. Because compassion has always best dealt with, with the uh, searchlight of honesty of what's really happened. And I'd be happy to have for you to talk to Richard uh, at the end of the session to give us your views too. I'll take that on, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I just got a quick question for Bill. Regarding the 50-50 leadership ballot, so you said that was a good way to give uh, power to the members at the expenses of the factional cabals. Yeah. So my question was simply that we saw a factional binding in the votes at the leadership ballot in the caucus. So do you anticipate this to be half of the course or do you want caucus members to be able to vote according to you know, their convictions or how do you see this playing out? No, you're wrong. Um, there's no uh, binding. There were members of the right who voted different ways than there were members of the left. I think that when we talk about our federal MPs, <coughs> I'm going to keep defending their integrity because they take the matters of leadership, I believe, as individual matters. By all means, they'll take soundings and they'll talk to people. But I believe that regardless of how individuals voted at the federal parliamentary caucus, they're all motivated not by factional considerations, they're motivated by their sense of what was the best interest of the Labor Party. So I would just say that you may have that view, but on behalf of my federal caucus colleagues, who voted uh, both ways, did you find that they were motivated, I believe, by what they thought were the best interests of the party and the nation, not some particular subset. The more general point about factions is this. Factions exist in all political parties, they exist in football clubs, they exist in religious organisations, they probably exist at, you know, at the school, in the schoolyard. But what we have to be as a Labour Party is we have to recognise and we have to make clear by our actions that you join the Labor Party first. Mm. All we have to make clear is that we're a membership-based party, not a factional-based party. We do this by providing more people the opportunities to have a say. That's what's motivating this talk today. Labor can't rebuild unless we can demonstrate to people that we've changed our ways. The way we change our ways is give more people the chance to have a say. Uh, factional excesses breed when there's a few people making decisions. I recognise, and this is not easy for me to say, I've seen all the sorts of decisions which have happened over 20 to 30 years, but I recognise that the truth can be hard, but it needs to be said. The truth is, the Slamber Party needs to be less factional and more membership based. This isn't exactly, well it does, it is a question. The media, you know, is basically all behind Tony Bloody Abbott. <laughs> uh, did I say something wrong there? No, but what, uh, what I'm, uh, the question is, do you have a policy, can you conceive a policy that can overcome the opposition that the media, and this applies largely around the world, but certainly in Australia, to overcome the negativeness from, that they have towards the uh, Labour Party? Well, look what, look what they're saying about the bloody ABC. I mean, I'm a friend of the ABC. I'll take that question both as a question but also a statement of some frustration with some of what you read. I, I can, as I read each day what they say about me, I can feel some of your frustration. But I'm not, I do not believe that as leader of the Labor Party, it suits Labor. It's in the interest of the nation for me to 
just complain about the coverage. I recognise that there are things you can control and the things you can't control. I recognise what we can control as a Labor Party is the way we conduct ourselves. I recognise as a Labor Party what we can control is our rebuilding process. It's one of the things we do control in the opposition. <laughs> That's why I have such thought to today's presentation, why I've spoken extensively to so many of my colleagues. I recognise that what we can control is the quality of our ideas. I recognise that if we fight for the government to keep their hands off superannuation, I recognise that if we fight for a fair go for older Australians to get discriminated in the jobs market, I think if we tell the truth about the challenges in our society, what we can control is to fight for better wages for childcare workers. What we can control is our stand we take on public education. What we can control is fighting for Medicare and universal Medicare, which the Liberals are never like. So what I say to you, my friend, is I understand your point, but I believe I serve the interests of Labor and the interests of Australians best by not focusing on what I can't control, but by being as positive, as optimistic and as hopeful, by making sure that my team work in a united fashion, by making sure that we've got a Labor Party where you can feel that you will get a go, even if you don't have a huge block vote, where you can feel you can be a representative one day for Labor in a reasonably winnable spot even if you run a small business in the high street of Wangaratta as opposed to running a group somewhere in the, you know, the suburbs of Melbourne. So I believe there are things we can control. So the way I keep positive from morning to night is I understand, like I think all of you fundamentally and deeply understand, otherwise you wouldn't be here, that despite the obstacles, when Labor has a strong centre and just a bit to the left set of policies which focus on jobs, education and health, which focus on truth and honesty, which focus on compassion, we can win no matter what they throw at us. We've just got to decide we want to be the party that Australia wants us to be for them. Chris Ginter, great step, step, Bill and Steve have taken. However, I think it is also very important to fight apathy. The Catholic Church, the Rotary Clubs, all find it very difficult to get members it is very easy to join them. So I think it is important for us to build our passion and to keep on stating, as Bill does often, to say what we stand for. And, it, and rather than being negative like Abbott was in the past three years. And your question? My question is, is are, are there any steps being taken to build that side of things of building a platform for policy statements to come out and say that uh, you know, this is what we really stand for so that we really build the passion of people. I, I recognise that um, there's lots of good news stories out there amongst the Labor Party. I watch uh, the campaign that South Australian Labor put in. I watch the rebuilding work which Daniel Andrews and the state team have been doing here. I watched what individual campaigns push to get a better deal for workers. I watched the efforts of disability advocates to build a national disability insurance scheme. What we need to recognise in Labor, if we are to convince the vast bulk of Australians, not just to vote for us, but to, but to engage with us and to give us the ideas of their everyday life, is we need to be campaigning, not just an institution. We need to be more than a party, we need to be a movement. There are fights out there worth having. And not all of them are in national politics. They can be in the suburbs, they can be in the streets, they can be in your workplaces. But what we need to do, as, as a party and as individuals in the party, be intolerant of the petty bullying and the petty stupidity and the petty vested interests that we see every day. We need to be people who will stand up, just as I refer to this senseless and just distressing murder of this woman by her uh, unhappy ex-spouse, Domestic violence is a scourge and we should be out there. We should be making sure people don't get ripped off at work. Where small businesses and high strip shopping centres are getting done over by, uh, by the large retail chains, we should be on their side. Where women are not getting a fair deal of work, we need to be loud and proud of these things. I believe there's much to be passionate about in today's society. We just need to decide that we want to be passionate and that we will be, and we need to convince others that their involvement Will change things because we know that if we get enough people involved, we can create a much tolerant, fairer, inclusive, and prosperous Australia. <laughs> <laughs>
Oscars from ABC News. Um, um, Mr. Shorten, are you worried that uh, some unions might fight your um, your agenda by withdrawing their funding from the ALP? Uh, it's up to unions what they do. Um, I'm not any union. I'm pro union. I just recognise that uh, it shouldn't be compulsory to work, be a union member to join the Labor Party because we limit our options. We do not serve the interests of people who go to work by saying that we will take some people and not other people. We do not serve the interests of people who depend upon Labor governments if we say that if you're a contract or an owner-operator or a small business person, somehow that isn't an area which Labor is interested in. In my experience, you do not serve the interests of working people by limiting the range of allies, by limiting the range of options, by limiting the range of issues that you speak up on. Australia is a diverse country. It's made up of men and women. It's made up of people who were born here and are Australians who are Australians by choice. It's made up of people with disabilities and their carers and people with disabilities. It used to be said that Labor was the political arm of the union movement. I'm saying today, as proud as I am of unions and what they've done, the Labor Party is the political arm of no one but the Australian people. That will be the secret of our success. Uh, thank you, Joshua. The, I think um, I know that in my dealings since the review which we undertook, <coughs> John Faulkner, Bob Carr, and myself, there's been enormous frustration within the Labor Party and with um, Labor Party supporters that we haven't acted as quickly as we could have on those reforms. But mark this day down. It's a bit like our moment in 1970. This is a day when the leader has said that he wants to produce reforms and that is very powerful. And he wants to do it for a very good reason, that he wants to get into government. And part of the process of getting into government is to recognise that we have um, we have a, a lack of democracy in the party producing substandard results. And this is the day in which this will change. And it will be bigger than even the, the, I think Bill Shorten has said today, because it will get some momentum around Australia as a result of this, and the changes will be significant and profound. It doesn't mean they'll be there forever, just as the 1970 reforms weren't there forever. We need to revisit it. And the great thing about the Australian Labor Party is, you know, we face up to this in an open and democratic way and we move forward uh, through change. We are different to the status quo party, the Abbott government, who's representing that, who resist and resist and resist change. And if there's a time for people to join the party, that it's now. We are, we are seeing now, in my lifetime, I'm seeing the most radical right-wing government I've ever seen at a federal or state level in the Abbott government. More radical than the Howard government ever was. John Howard, in some ways, had his feet on the ground and he understood what people wanted. This is a government that wants to punish its enemies and wants to attack the very fundamentals of the Australian Labor Party in any way it can. Here is a call to arms. Here is a reason to join the Labor Party, to produce good policies and to produce good people to get back to stop this happening in the future. And that's why this is important. And that's why it's important. That's why looking forward, um, uh, Joshua, you should mark down this as the, the per capita wheel of centre day which changed the Australian Labor Party. <laughs>